This is the Rational Reminder Podcast, a weekly reality check on sensible investing and financial decision-making for Canadians. We are hosted by me, Benjamin Felix, and Cameron Passmore, Portfolio Managers at PWL Capital. Episode 166, welcome. And as people have seen, I think from a couple of weeks ago, podcast, I'm back in the office and you've got your new home office set up. Unfortunately, we don't have live Oscar, but we do have Oscar here over my, for those on YouTube, over my right shoulders, we have Oscar painted on my wall in the office. So he is here in spirit, even though you won't see him as in the past, jumping up in the chair beside me. And love other news, what's that? I love that wall. Yeah, it's, it's pretty, pretty cool actually. So maybe we'll post a picture of it on our Instagram page. That's a good idea. Anyway, did I tell you that my daughter Anna moved out, got her own place. Nice wow. new place. It's a nice uh, condo in the south end of Ottawa. So she's pretty happy, pretty proud. So I'm halfway to being an empty nester. Just James and I at home now with Oscar. Wow. For those who don't know, James works on our team. So we're both, when we're working at home, working away. So I'm coming into the office most of the time. But I think most of the time you're going to be at your home office, right? That's the plan. Excellent. And it looks like a pretty sweet setup for those who can see. Um, I like I like my home office a lot. It's a nice. Uh, well, nice it's amazing, you know. We're we're I think we're both like for example, yesterday we're recording this on Friday the third, but yesterday I, I had too much work to come to the office to do. I mean, it's so efficient and effective working from home. I find just get up and jump right into it. So what an interesting comment. Imagine what that means about the efficiency of pre-pandemic work life. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, it's different work, right? Like at the office, you have much more interaction, so it's a different, but like yesterday, I just had to put my head down and get a lot done, so stay right. home and you just crank it out. Right. Um, we've mentioned this before, but we love hearing from listeners, and I know you and I get lots of reach, reach outs, either by email or um, mainly email, I guess, and also on other platforms like LinkedIn especially. Uh, we've met all kinds of people, people looking to get into the industry, how do they break in, looking for feedback on what courses to take. We've also had a number of people um, that are in the industry looking for guidance of how do they make a change. You know, we've had a number of people join our team that we've met that way, which has been incredible. Um, a lot of firms in our industry grow by, you know, buying books of business or acquiring other firms. And that's not really how we operate. However, if you are an advisor and you want to talk and you kind of think you might be a good fit, if you've listened to the podcast, you know how we invest. You kind of know how we operate, how we think about planning. If you think you might be a fit, reach out. We'd be happy to talk. We're not aggressively looking to grow uh, with new advisors, but hey, we're open to talking to you if you think uh, it might work out. Definitely. There, there's enough people out there that think and operate the way that we do. And what we're doing fine in terms of growth on our own, but I do love the idea of becoming sort of the the hub for uh, the, the advisors in Canada that think and, and operate the way that we do. Yeah, especially if you would appreciate being on a team. Um, we have one approach, one philosophy. We have redundancy in all the different roles. We have decentralized, you know, things like trading and operations and service and whatnot. So if that seems appealing to you, you know, drop us a line. A lot of new recent reviews we've had, which is great. I just checked and we've up to almost 700 reviews in iTunes. And uh, we tried to highlight every one of them here. So Holly says, great podcast, learned a lot about finance. And she especially enjoys the episodes about money and well-being, which is great to hear. We've had a lot of people say that. And uh, great content. DFAX in Great Britain reached out to say they particularly appreciate the host's evidence-based critical thinking, not only when sharing their expertise in finance, but also when discussing topics such as human biases, psychology, and even search for meaning and happiness. Again, thanks for reaching out. Also from Shambolic Dingo in Germany, thank you both for providing such insightful content. The podcast introduced my entire family to the world of evidence-based investing. And the other bonus from this one is I got to learn what Shambolic means. It actually means chaotic, disorganized, or mismanaged. Did you know that? Nope. I would have guessed that was a made-up word. That's why I thought you were going to laugh at it like you normally do. Uh, Chris said, just finished a play through every episode from the beginning, and I'm sold. Uh, we present information and the evidence to back it up. The only downside is that once you've listened to every episode you want, 
Moore and no other podcast I've found has quite this academic and practical rooting. It's very, very kind. <clears throat> on that note, did you know that on average, 10 people a day listen to our very first episode? No, that's crazy. But you know what? You know what? I that 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 review though. Um, I I find that personally, there, there are some other podcasts that I listen to, not a ton. Um, but I I hope this doesn't sound I don't know self serving or weird in some way. I love listening to our own podcast, not <laughs> not necessarily to the ones where it's you and I talking, but when we have like a a, a guest yeah. episode that's really good, going back and listening to those, I uh, I enjoy that thoroughly. And and there are not a ton of podcasts out there that I'll go in and re listen to episodes. Yeah, I, I'm trying to listen to one guest, one past guest episode a week just to keep it fresh because it's an unbelievable collection, but there's so many now. So this ties in, though, to the new comprehensive overview that we released as a sort of a pilot uh, a couple of weeks ago. And I, I think it was very successful. I mean, it was one of our most download ep- downloaded episodes uh, really quickly. Uh and just the feedback on on YouTube in the comments and in the community was extremely positive. So definitely we'll continue with that series, um, probably quarterly-ish. I don't know. Did you find it easier to prepare? Because that one, you did pull it all together. Uh, I, took, I took the easy road in that one. That, that one specifically was okay, but I started looking at um, doing inflation... Mm -hmm. Uh, government debt and quantitative easing is another comprehensive overview. I just started poking around, seeing what was out there. And uh, that one will be much more challenging to prepare, but I think it's also going to be a great episode. Um, But anyway, there's a ton of topics that I think we can, we can pull out of past guest episodes like that. So um, yeah, I I appreciate everybody's feedback on that, but it's definitely, it's definitely an idea that is going to continue, uh, continue going in the future. Also want to highlight the AMA coming up September 15th at 3 p.m. with Jack Vogel. Should be very good. And upcoming guests. Man, we've got some good guests coming up. So economist Hirsch Sheffrin is coming up next week. Two weeks after that, John Cochran, the grumpy economist. So we talked to him earlier this week, and that was an amazing conversation. And then two weeks after that will be economist and author Campbell Harvey. You you got Campbell Harvey to come on. Yeah, that's a, that. I mean, I, I don't know. I don't know how many people look at that lineup and they're like starstruck, but they, they should be because <laughs> that <laughs> those three people are uh, they're like pillars of modern finance. It's a uh, yeah, it's no joke. And to come up back to back to back, I mean. And the people before this are no joke, and we got some great guests lined up after that. It's 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 pretty amazing. Wanted to highlight in the store the Talking Sense cards, just to remind everybody they're in stock. These are the cards that are from the University of Chicago Financial Education Initiative. They're professionally done. They're professionally written. They're designed for families just to get conversations going about money, ideally for ages seven and older. Just have them by your kitchen table and pull out a card or two every once in a while. So $30 per deck. Angelica set it up on the store such that if you buy any other item over $15, you get 20% off the cards. And also you get a free pair of socks with it, the Irrational Minder socks and free shipping in North America. So if you have family members at home, kids at home, I would argue you really should get a deck. It's cheap and it, they, they really do work and do get conversations going. Uh, I, I haven't used them with my kids a ton. My, my oldest is is six. Um, probably he, he could he probably would get it, but we haven't done a ton of it. But I had a, a friend of mine over uh, the other day, and we pulled the cards out like you know two two grown men. I guess kind of like how we do it <laughs> on the podcast. Um, we were cooking some steaks outside, and we took out the talking sense cards, and it's it's actually pretty fun and yeah. Uh, it's a yeah interesting way to pass the time with somebody. As always, stay in touch. Love to hear from listeners, as we mentioned earlier. So we're on LinkedIn. You can check out Rational Mind on Instagram. Uh, connect on Goodreads. We're both on Twitter. We're on, I'm on Peloton at CP313. There's also hashtag Rational Reminder on Peloton. So that community is growing as well. Anything else? Oh, let's go ahead to the episode.
Welcome to episode 166 of the Rational Reminder podcast. So we'll kick it off quickly with a book, which frankly, this book could be an entire podcast series on its own, but the book is called Nudge, the Final Edition by Richard Thaler and Cass Sunstein. So they wrote the original book, I think it was back in 2008, I believe. So this is newly revised and updated. I'm sure many listeners have read the book or heard about it. And it's, it's kind of become a business classic. And since we talked about the book Noise back in episode 154 that Cass Sunstein, Sunstein was a co-author of, I decided to check this out because it just was released and it showed up in my Kindle. So I thought, well, we'll talk about this book and give it a, uh, a reread. So it has been completely updated, but the basic proposition of the book, if you don't know, is that people make choices all the time and how choices are presented or framed can greatly impact how people do make decisions. So in, in their words, the author's words, they say, choice architecture matters. It's interesting, they call it, uh, in their words, libertarian paternalism, which they say marries the freedom of libertarianism along with the guidance and oversight of paternalism, but without the, the, the force. The, it's all, all about giving a guide to help you make things that are likely to help you without harming you. I mean, the classic example that I think many people have heard of is, you know, food displayed in a cafeteria line. If you put healthier food earlier in the line, the consumption of healthier food increases, right? They also talk about how so many decisions that people make are autom automatic based on, you know, heuristics or rules of thumb. And frankly, we have to do that. Otherwise, you'd never get through your day because we make so many decisions every day that that's the way it has to be. Um, and they give you know countless examples in this book, um, and some are current day examples. Like they talk about the pandemic and how easily humans are nudged by other people. People like to conform, and if people see others behaving in a certain way, they will follow. And if you're in a community, whether it's a, a, a real physical community or it's a digital community, people will behave like the norm of that community. And they wow. talk about this with mask wearing. And I'm not being political, but depending on what community you're in, you'll have an opinion uh, or a tendency in terms of behavior with masks. Another good one they talk about, you know, especially now with return to school, back to school time, they talk about how college students' academic effort is affected by their roommate. So if you end up getting a studious roommate or someone that performs well at school, your marks will go up. So that's pretty cool. Again, can you, see conform, that. you conform to people around you. Well, we see it in our office, right? We have a culture of, of pursuing uh, further education. So a lot of people are doing all kinds of different credentials here in the office. Mm. Um, they talk about having issues with self-control, and we often, often make choices that after the fact we might regret, especially when the time between making the decision and, and experiencing the consequence might be long, something like, you know, between eating dessert and having it show up in your waistline might be a long time mm -hmm. or, or retirement savings. So you can always put off decisions. So again, another nudge is having um, members in a you know defined contribution plan, have an automatic enrollment. So you actually have to opt out of the plan as opposed to opt into the plan. Well, if you have a, a default opt into the plan, there's much greater levels of participation. So they give some examples of how to improve your own decision making, you know, things like the checklist manifesto, which we've talked about, you know, have a forced checklist to go through things. They talk about how if you make big decisions, break them down into smaller ones to try to get them down to kind of a rule of thumb level so that you can yeah, make a decision. Um, like they give examples of, one example they gave was talking about, should I take a new job that's in another city? Like that's a big decision, like do I move? Do I sell? Do I buy? Do I rent? Do I like the city? What sort of neighbors do I want? There's all kinds of things that you can go through and decide on each of those little micro decisions that add up to the big decision. And they also talk, I thought this is interesting, talk about elimination by aspects. Like take all the things that you would eliminate. Like I would only move if I'm making X. So mm -hmm. any jobs that are below X, they're off the table without even being, otherwise you get into, well, it's a cool company, it's a good city. No, no, you said you got to make X before you make the decision. Or I will not take a job that is more than two hours away from where my 
my kids' grandparents live. Hmm. So all the interesting jobs, no matter what the pay level is, how interesting it is, they're just off the table. Anyways, I, I, you could talk about this book forever. There's so many, so many examples in there. I, I highly recommend it. It's a super easy read. A little comical too in places. They actually seem to be pretty, pretty funny people. Sounds excellent. Maybe I'll read it. It is. And you think back to past guests we've had that talk about making decisions, be it Andy Duke or Ashley Willens, or the list goes on, right? It's so it's a really interesting book. Highly recommend it. Do you want to go on to the one story of the week? Uh, sure, yeah. This was a story that, uh, I don't know if you found it or I found it, but an article from Magnify Money. Um, is a survey they, they, they did of 1,116 U.S. consumers that had an investment account conducted the last week of June of this year, who and they sought to determine if investors let the emotions, their emotions influence their investment decisions. Interesting, kind of talking about this after talking about nudge, but they're trying to determine if the quality of decisions that, that what was a quality of the decisions or what behavior was going when they made those decisions. So get this for some of these key findings. 66% of the investors have made an impulsive or emotionally charged investing decision they later, later regret it. Now, one thing about the participants in this, it would be nice to know how many people were, say, on the Robinhood type platform. 32% of investors have traded while drunk. Yeah, that's the, I mean, this, that's the headline of the story. <laughs> yeah. This includes 59% of Gen Z, which are age 18 to 24, investors who have bought or sold an investment while inebriated more than any other age group. Now, th th this is interesting because when we talked to Hirsch Sheffrin to record that episode, I I'm pretty sure it was a conversation with Hirsch. Uh, he, he said, we, we, I asked something about making some kind of decision and, and uh, he specifically said not to do it after you've had a couple drinks. Do you remember that? Yeah. There's another paper that's somewhat related to this uh, that, that I found after our conversation with Hirsch. I went and dug this paper up. It was a 2009 study, but Hirsch talks about thrill seeking in her conversation with yeah. him and its relationship to stock trading. So that comes from, I think, this paper, it's 2009 paper, um, Sensation Seeking Overconfidence in Trading Activity. And they, they had this Finnish uh, from, from Finland data set. Uh, where they had, I can't remember all the data points, but a whole bunch of data points where they could really build out a psychological profile of a person, including like their driving record. Um, I can't remember what else, but they were able to build a profile of thrill-seeking individuals and then look at how those people traded in their investment accounts. Cra crazy access to that kind of data, but um, huh. this is the study. And they found that the, the most thrill-seeking people are the most co overconfident and trade the most. In their wow. brokerage accounts. Wow. Isn't that crazy? And he talked to, uh, talked about the link that it's somewhat like having dopamine dopamine in your system. Oh, it is. Yeah. It is. He, he said it, it is like having dopamine and it, it's it's the same effect as, as uh, when someone first starts to use opiates. Yep. So coming up later this year, we have Dr. Anna Lemke from Stanford coming on who just released a book called Dopamine. So she'll be on later to talk exactly about that. So other things they find, those that self-manage their investments report higher rates of lost sleep and regrettable decisions than those who use an advisor. Most investors, 58%, agree their portfolio performs better when emotions are left out of the equation, but that's easier said than done. 37% of investors have lost sleep worrying about the stock market and 30% have cried over investing. Hmm. Top reason for tears includes losing money in the stock market, feeling overwhelmed, and get this, selling too early. On a more positive note, 44% of investors say they feel excited about investing, the most popular sentiment. Is that good, feeling excited about investing? Not so sure. Stress followed know. closely behind with 41% of investors tensing up at the starting bell. I think feeling, uh, there, there's actually a quote somewhere, I can't remember exactly what it is, but um, if you feel excited about your investments, you're, you're doing something wrong, something yeah. like that. <laughs> Anyway, uh, listener so, questions. Fire away. So we did the the listener question we did uh, recently was on Cape, and I went through this whole long thing about how Cape's completely useless. 
not how it's completely useless, but why, why it's difficult to use to predict uh, returns. And then I prepared for our conversation with John Cochran. Uh, and John has done a lot of work on predictability, uh, which is which is great. And I'd read his paper-ish. And actually, just a side note, I, it, John's, the, the preface to his book, he talks about how there are so many important papers in economics that have formed what has become his his fiscal theory of the price level, which is his current big, huge uh, work that he's writing a book about. Uh, there's so many important papers that he had skimmed through along the way, but he, he says like reading academic papers is hard. So he hadn't really read them. And then as he went along through time trying to figure out this theory, uh, he would talk to other economists and they would say, oh, you got to read my paper on this. And it was one of the papers that he'd skimmed over. So he'd finally go after that push and read the paper in detail. And then there were a bunch of breakthroughs that he had through that type of experience. So anyway, it was the same kind of thing for me with this, <laughs> where, where I read John's paper, uh, but not thoroughly enough, clearly. And then uh, I guess my, my kick in the pants to really read it properly was to prepare for the interview that we, that we had with him. Um, so John says in, in his paper that the, the Goyle and Welch study and the Dimson study, the Dimson, Marsh and Staunton study that we talked about that sort of disproved predictability he says that it's that that's a diagnostic, uh, but it's not a test. And he says the low out of sample explanatory power findings from those papers are they're an important caution about market timing. You can't use those forecasts to build an aggressive market timing portfolio, but they're not a statistical test of predictability. Uh, so he says the present value logic implies that if both returns and dividend, and this is going to melt people's brains. If, <laughs> if, 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 <laughs> if you're listening on, on 2x speed, you should slow down. Uh, slow, slow down, down now. Right? Present value logic implies that if both returns and dividend growth are unforecastable, uh, the price dividend ratio is constant. So if both returns and dividend growth are unforecastable, the price dividend ratio is a constant. Empirically, we know that's not true because the price dividend ratio is extremely volatile. So then the question that Cochran asks is how much of dividend growth or returns is forecastable rather than just looking at returns. Um, and historically, we know that high prices have been resolved by low subsequent returns, not by higher dividend growth, which implies that returns are indeed forecastable. Uh, so all, all those other studies really just showed us that we can't time the market, but that doesn't mean that returns are not predictable. And it's, it's kind of weird, right? Like what does predictability mean if we can't use it to time the market? And from our conversation with John, which people will hear, uh, will hear coming up in a future episode, it's basically like we can build really wide parameters around, uh, how expected returns are different based on predictability, based on valuation metrics, but they're nowhere near precise enough, not even close to being precise enough to, to use them to time the market. And he actually says that in our conversation with him, that he personally does not use this information to try and time the market <laughs> because it's too noisy. But if you're developing return expectations, maybe you would include some of it. Uh, and we actually, we're, we're done that paper now on expected returns. It's just being cleaned up and we're putting all the all the proper references and table numbers in. And what we ended up doing uh, in the end is using 25% uh, predictability contribution to the model and 75% historical for stocks. And then the inverse of that, 75% predictability contribution for bonds, 25% historical historical average. So that paper will come out uh, probably in the next few weeks and we can talk more about it then. But that was, you know, pr that, that's very different from what I said when we talked about CAPE last time. So I'm, uh, I'm always happy to learn. <laughs> <laughs> and people will yeah. hear more about that because that, that, the, the very first question that I asked John in our interview with him is uh, about that. And we talk about it pretty extensively. And it's the thing that I found really amazing is how important that piece of information is to all of the other theory on portfolios that John has done throughout his career. Because you kind of look at the timeline of all the work that he's done and where he is now on his thinking and all of it stems from uh, return predictability and cash flow unpredictability. Hmm. He's up in three weeks, episode 169. So that was an update on the on a previous listener question. The actual listener question, 
Uh, Jeremy G asks, should evidence-based investors, read listeners of the podcast, be looking to convert family members who, who fit into the average, aka active investor archetype? If yes, how? Such a great question. Great question. Uh, it's a touchy subject. subject. Uh, money is very emotional. Uh, investors are myopic. They evaluate stuff over short time intervals, even if it's a long-term decision. Uh, I, I think one of the challenges with this if, is that if you do manage to convince someone to switch to index investing and then the market declines, uh, or they go and check how their previous active fund or, or stocks were are, are doing two years later and, and they realize that they're underperforming by, by using index funds instead of what they were doing before, it could create tension. Obviously, that's highly relationship dependent. Um, people really need to arrive at this decision on their own. And that, that's one of the things that for, for us at, at PWL has been such an important part of our experience is that uh, there, there was a time where we would get referrals from existing clients or we would, we used to do, remember we used to do a radio show, Cameron, before the yeah. podcast, yeah. Cameron and I did a weekend radio show on the local <laughs> radio in Ottawa. A uh, phone-in show, yeah. phone show. And, and we would get, uh, pe- people that were interested in working with us, but they wouldn't know what indexing was. And we'd have to go through this whole education process and it was it was really difficult. And, and now it's the opposite where people are, are coming to us have having been already educated and like, I want I want this. I want exactly what you do. Uh, so we don't try to convince people. We we put the information out there and, and people who are ready to consume it can, can do so. Well, it's such now, a polarizing topic, right? So many people are so set in their ways. And the default everywhere in your life is that you can be better, you can be above average. So it just naturally becomes part of what you might seek in this profession or from it's this like profession. The, what, what people used to say about Bogle, that, that index funds are un-American. Yeah. Same kind of, uh, same kind of idea. I, th- there, there's a quote from uh, Kahneman uh, uh, that he, he gave at a CFA uh, conference about uh, I can't remember the exact quote, but it's it's something along the lines of it's just this is not a field where you can build intuition because there's not enough. Uh, it, it's too random. You, you can't build intuition because of all oh. all the randomness. It's not a field in which you can learn, which is pretty interesting in terms of predicting predicting the market. You can learn, just not not about how to outperform. Uh, now, th- so so this question was. It came at a time when I was, or I read at least at a time when, when I was reading, which I still am, uh, the book, Cameron, that you mentioned in episode 136, which is Think Again by Adam Grant. Mm. So I, I do take your book recommendations eventually. <laughs> <laughs> Just takes me, uh, it takes me a while. Uh, so he, the, the, the book is about uh, thinking like a scientist rather than preaching, prosecuting, and, and politicking um, with, your, with your beliefs. Uh, having humility over pride and how you think, having more doubt rather than certainty and more curiosity rather than closure in your thinking and in your beliefs. And there's a chapter in the book on how to talk to other people uh, when you want to help them change their mind or help them think more like a scientist. So I, I wanted to mention a couple of points there because I think it's maybe useful for the type of conversations that people might have with family or friends or whatever if they want to talk to them about this. The, the other weird thing about this, you know, is that once you get your head into it, it, it become you become passionate about it because you realize how much sense it makes and how right it is, which makes you want to help other people in your life. But it's not always that easy. Uh, so the first big one is don't be a logic bully. If you go and b- bombard somebody who doesn't share your beliefs with all of the facts and figures and, and data uh, for, for why you hold your beliefs, that's one of the worst things that you can do. Um, Adam Grant says that trying to change someone's mind is a, is a negotiation where you're trying to reach an agreement about the truth. And if you just bombard them with information, it can end up backfiring um, pretty hard. Uh, he says that you should find things that you do agree on. And I just wrote examples. Like, I, I, I think we can agree that it's the returns after fees and taxes that we care about. You could agree with anybody on that. No one's going to disagree with you on that. I don't think. <laughs> It's not very disagreeable. <laughs> um, another one is I, I, I wrote is I, I think we can agree that there are fewer examples of successful a- active managers than ones who fail to beat the market. I think most people would agree with that. 
works. <laughs> Uh, another one is to find things that you're willing to change your mind about in the discussion. Um, I had trouble thinking of one for that, but I, I had the example of saying that you're impressed with, you know, this fund that, that someone's invested in and how strong the track record is that you can be impressed with that without sacrificing your beliefs. Even if it's a random outcome, still impressed. <laughs> Uh, fo- focus on fewer That's strong arguments. That's the part arg- you don't say in your argument, I'm guessing. <laughs> oh, yeah, right. Uh, did I say that out loud? Uh, fo- focus on fewer strong arguments rather than too many, uh, than a, a whole bunch of not as strong arguments. And the reason for that one is that if if your negotiation partner is able to reject one of your arguments, then they'll dismiss the whole case and they won't be interested in listening to you anymore. So well, he talks so, about finding... Yeah, hmm? So often you get the what aboutism, right? Like, well, what about... Renaissance Technologies. What about Warren Buffett? That's what you always get, right? Yeah, for sure. Um, if people don't care much about the issue, if they're open to your argument, and if they're not strong-willed, then giving more reasons can actually be helpful. So if someone comes to you and says, hey, like I'm interested in index investing, can you tell me about it? Um, then dumping all the facts and data maybe is a little bit more useful. But if somebody has a stake in the issue, if they're skeptical of review and if they're stubborn, then piling on the logic is more likely to backfire. So that's when you don't want to be a a logic bully. Uh, Ask questions about the position of the other party. These ones I think are pretty interesting. So my my example questions are, uh, do do you see any merit to the concept of index investing? Uh, What would cause you to reconsider your position on active management? Exactly. What evidence would change your mind? And it, it, what Adam Grant says in the book is that if you ask that question, what evidence would change your mind or what, what would change your mind on this? If the answer to the question is nothing, then that's like you're done. That's it. There's nothing you can, there's nothing you can do. So you just end the conversation and, yep. and, uh, and move on. And then an- another interesting suggestion is to have a conversation about the conversation. So if it gets uncomfortable for whatever reason, uh, you can discuss the discussion so you can say, like, I don't think this conversation is going that well. How do you feel about it? I, I was kind of hoping that you might uh, see this this information or these ideas as sensible. Am, am I correct that you don't see any merit in them at all? And he says that, that can really uh, ch- change change the tone or shift the direction to be more more favorable and kind of calm people down if a discussion gets heated. I mean, is that really going to happen about index funds versus active funds, a heated discussion? I guess it could happen. People do get pretty passionate about it. Uh, and then another big one is to not have really strong opinions. And that one's kind of counterintuitive, but having a little bit of uncertainty, uh, a little bit of confident humility, uh, makes, according to Adam Grant, makes it makes the whole discussion more palatable for the person on the other side of the argument or discussion. Um, so I, my example is like you know, indexing is a pretty good, pretty good idea for for most people. It's not perfect, and it's not for everybody. Oh. There's a certain personality profile that it's really appealing to as well. Like if you're out for excitement or, as you've said many times, skewness, you want that lottery payoff, that's not for you. Right. It isn't. If you have other things that are important to you in your life, you don't want to get into the minutia of a portfolio and you don't enjoy necessarily doing day-to-day research on things, it makes a lot of sense. Remember the time yeah. when the light went off for you? On index investing? Yeah. You know this story. You just make me that, retell the, it. The, the time. Do you remember that? Like, what was the tipping? Was it the article? Was a tipping point? <laughs> I think so. I think so. So I've, I've, I've told this story before, I'm sure. But before I met Cameron, I was doing my MBA, selling mutual funds, which is a job that I had gotten through an internship program through my MBA uh, school. Uh, so I got my... I did an internship where I was working for an advisor doing like financial planning analysis and, and building PowerPoints to make cases about um, uh, different financial planning things. And then after that, the, the firm was like, you know, do, do you want to continue to work here? And I'm like, great, a, a job. Yeah, definitely. And then it was like, cool, get your, go, go do your mutual funds course, we'll pay for it. Go do your insurance course, we'll pay for it if you pass. And then it was all commission selling. I was like, oh, geez. And the, the crazy part is that they indoctrinate you. Like it's, and it's nothing against any of the guys that I used to work with, but 
you know, they have people come in from fund companies for the lunch and learn once a week or once every couple of weeks. And they're talking about what they're doing in portfolios and why their managers are, you know, the best and their track record and all this stuff. Um, and you just, you just kind of learn that's what's right. And there was a, there was a, a presentation going around from Fidelity about, it was, it was like a, it was like a yeah. smoking PowerPoint from a cigarette company. It's like showing all the <laughs> Fidelity funds that have beat the index. Like why would anybody index? And this is back in like 2011 or 12, I guess, probably 2012. Um, it's crazy to think back then that fund companies were putting out disinformation about about index uh, index investing. Anyway, so I, I managed to get um, an interview in the, with the Globe and Mail. I guess I was I was hustling my media presence even back then. Um, so I managed to get this article in in the Globe and Mail, and it, it was about f- some fund some fidelity fund that I was told was a good product <laughs> and uh, it got absolutely obliterated in the comments Good to see if and that was online. that was the first real big light bulb for me where uh, I went and started doing doing my own deep research which led me to find dimensional and led me to find PWL and then all that stuff got connected yeah I, I called Dimensional and talked to somebody there. And then a few months later, Dimensional called me back and said that there was this firm in Ottawa that was looking for somebody. And then that closed the loop with Cameron. But I already found PWL and thought it was like the coolest firm ever because they're, they're securities license as opposed to mutual funds license when they're portfolio managers and they're using index funds. It's just like this the coolest place ever that I would love to work. And then Dimensional closed the loop on the whole thing. It's pretty, pretty crazy. But that was the light bulb. The light bulb was the yeah. article. Of, like, I, I just got blasted by a bunch of people on the internet. <laughs> I just looked quickly. I can't see the article on the first page of Google, but it's worth hunting down if you can find it. That's good. Yeah, the, the, the rest of my life since then, <laughs> doing stuff on the internet has just been to push that search, re- search result further down on Google. <laughs> yeah, I remember I was 15 years ahead of you, of course. I remember the we used to be trained to defend ourselves against index funds, and it was all crazy. And as soon as we went fee-based, we joined the company in 97. It was all over. And then we hung on to one active manager, I forget the name of it, value manager from California and like they left the com- company that was sub they were sub advisors to a company and they left and it's just a mess and the performance was terrible and so wait what are the MERs the MERs were over three percent like it was just completely crazy in hindsight this is this wow. like 95 to 97 right a long time ago long before like ETS were just getting going so anyways we should roll on to the main topic you wanted to talk about the lessons from Hundred plus years of global stock returns. Yeah, so I had this idea. We'll we'll, we'll see how it goes. Uh, hopefully, it's useful. But I, I I've I've read a lot of work from um, professors Dimson, Marsh, and Staunton, who they they had their book uh, Triumph of the Optimists back in two thousand two, which sort of transformed into the Global Investment Returns Yearbook that they do every year with the Credit Suisse Research Institute now. And I, I often go back and, and, and reference past uh, summary reports. They, they publish summary reports for free online. It's like a, a small section of the full uh, yearbook that they produce. The actual yearbook, they only produce in hard copy and you have to be a customer of Credit Suisse, I think, to access it. But the summary, though, is, is pretty great. It has a lot of good information. Uh, and I was, for, I was doing research on something recently and, and was reading one of the reports and just thought to myself, you know, I've read most of these and there's all these really cool little bits of analysis in uh, across all of them so i thought it'd be interesting to try and take like a cross section of the most interesting findings that dimson marsh and staunton have found and i i didn't mention yet the the unique aspect of their research is that they have this proprietary data series that they created you can purchase access to it like we we have a license for it but it's not widely available to the public um So it goes back to 1900. It currently has 23 countries, 21 countries with continuous histories because Russia and China don't have continuous histories, but they're still in the database. Yeah, yeah. so they use this data to answer all sorts of interesting questions that that are relevant to investors. Um, So one of the biggest ones, and we've talked about this in the podcast, I think many times, is that US stock market returns have been an anomaly. Uh, It's interesting to think back though, in 2002, people didn't really know that. Like that wasn't a widely held fact that U.S. stocks have performed the best in the world because we didn't have really good data for the rest of the world. 
Uh, from 1900 through 2020, U.S. stocks have delivered an annualized 6.6% per year adjusted for inflation. Inflation over that period is 3%. That's a 9.9% nominal return over the full period. The rest of the world, excluding the U.S., has delivered an annualized 4.5% over the same wow. period. So more than 200 basis points of negative tracking error for the rest of the world, excluding the U.S. relative to the U.S. So expecting the U.S. experience to repeat is eh, pr probably not the best idea, uh, especially considering how, and we just talked about CAPE. Um, it does have some predictive power, probably, or at least uh, valuations do in general. So expected returns in the U.S. are probably lower. I mean, you look at how expensive the U.S. market is right now compared to the past. It's it's pretty expensive right now, uh, like almost sc scarily so. Um, not that I'm predicting anything. I was going to say, put the caveat. Yeah, who knows? What, it, it could go higher, and it can always go. It can always go higher, or it could stay at this level, and earnings can catch up. Even though that's not typically what happens, it uh, it, it could happen. Uh, anyway, the, the the point is though that that looking at the U.S. 10% historical return, which many people do, and assuming that's going to be your future return, probably not. Probably not the smartest idea. Uh, in, in the 2009 yearbook, which is the earliest one that they post the summary of on online, I think with the timing, this is a global financial crisis, 2000, 2008 had just happened. Uh, their objective in the, in the 2009 yearbook was to restore people's confidence in stocks. Because the other thing that was happening is that 2008 happened, uh, but that decade had not been so great even before. Mm -hmm. the financial crisis in terms of uh, total market stock returns uh, and not just for the U.S. There, there was uh, a, a lot of the countries in the, in the database um, ha had r negative real returns for that, for that decade. Um, So-called lost is, decade. Right. But it's not just the U.S., right? I, I often hear that quoted for the, the, the U.S. lost decade. Um, but it was it was bad for for most of the countries. I, I actually most countries of, of the nineteen countries in the database at the time, most of the countries had negative real returns for the full period. And the other tricky thing about that is that the nineteen nineties had just happened where stock returns were really good. So it's like what's what's going on? Uh, and then you step back, of course, and from nineteen hundred through two thousand eight at the time, returns were nice and positive um, everywhere. And then even that's that's still true now, bringing the data up to 2020. So the point that they wanted to make in in their analysis here was was that l this bad period just happened, this bad decade, and this bad um, this bad crash just happened. The long term has been pretty good, and look what else has happened in the long term. So they go through all these major world events um, from 1900. Uh, so from 1914 to 1918, which is World War One period. Uh, global stocks had a cumulative loss. This is not annualized. It's cumulative for the full period. A cumulative loss of minus 31% over the four-year period. Uh, from 1929 to 31, global stocks had a minus 54% cumulative return, which was kicked off by the stock market crash in 1929. Yep. Uh, 1939 to 48, global stocks lost a cumulative 12%, coincident with World War II. Some countries did a lot worse, and I'll mention those in a, in a second. Uh, global stocks lost a cumulative 47% from 1973 to 74 with the oil shock. Uh, lost 44% from 2000 to 2002 with the internet bust. Yep. And lost 40... What's that? Yep, I remember it well. <laughs> right. And lost 41% in 2008 with the financial crisis. Now, individual countries, this is crazy. So from 1939 to 1948, Japanese stocks lost a cumulative 96% wow. of their value. The U.S. stock market lost 61% from 1929 to 31, and the U.K. lost 71% from 1973 to 74. So it kind of speaks to the need for diversification, I would say, a, a little bit. <laughs> then the big takeaway is that you know there have been these bad periods, but there there yeah. have also been offsetting good periods. Like they talk about 1919 to 1928, uh, after World War uh, One, stocks returned 168 percent cumulative. From 1949 to 59, they returned a cumulative 395 uh, percent. 1980s, they delivered a 257 percent uh, return, 111 percent through the 90s. Yeah. So bad times, there are also good times, nets out to be not so bad, but there are really bad times. 
it's probably not news to anybody that's investing in stocks, but I think it is important for everybody to understand. Uh, what, one of the things that I found interesting in looking at these data is that they are, they're using annual data. COVID last year would not have shown up. If you're using daily data, it probably would have. But using annual data, of course. Last, last year there was a 16.8 percent return for the for the world index. Crazy. It's true, but the drawdown in March was huge. Right. But if you're using calendar year returns, which is what they're using, then it doesn't it show up. Gets washed out. Wow. You gotta wonder what other intra year craziness is not yeah. included in, in their data. Uh, another big one for like, okay, we have these crashes. You know, we did a video on bear markets and market crashes and how stuff come, tends to come back pretty quickly. And, and those videos ended up um, kind of coinciding with the bottom, which was, you know, kind of fun in hindsight that markets bounce right back. But that doesn't always happen. Uh, global stocks returned a cumulative negative 8% in real terms from 1910 to 1931. Uh, mm -hmm. Germany, France, and Japan have all experienced periods where real stock returns were negative for more than 50 years. People talk about Japan's 30-year flat uh, real return period. But uh, yeah, it can go longer than that. And it, and it has historically. Uh, so that's, that's kind of that for that piece. Uh, I, I mentioned the importance of sort of separating how have global stocks done from how have U.S. stocks done in terms of making, uh, forming expectations about the future. One of the other things that they do in one of the yearbooks that's really interesting is decompose the historical risk premium. Where have the returns actually come from? Because we can kind of say, you know, hey, this segment of returns we might expect to repeat. Can't guarantee it, but it might repeat. But this piece of returns, there's no reason to expect that to repeat. So they break it down into geometric mean dividend yield, net of the risk-free rate, the annualized growth rate on real dividends, and the annualized change in the price dividend ratio over time. Mm -hmm. The single biggest driver of returns uh, in, in this sample is dividend yield. And we talked about this with John Cochran that, that like companies have to pay dividends eventually. And theoretically, that has to be true for them to have value. It doesn't mean you have to own dividend-paying stocks, but it must be true that companies will eventually distribute their earnings as dividends. And that's in the historical, historical data, that's exactly what has happened. In, in the long run, companies pay dividends and that's where a, a big chunk of returns comes from. Um, so that, that makes sense. The, the, the other big drivers of returns are the growth rate of real dividends and the change in the price to dividend ratio. Uh, so Dimson, Marsh, and Staunton kind of say that in the, in the second half of the 20th century, uh, decreasing risk probably uh, boosted price multiples, but probably permanently. Risk decreases, prices increase. But if risk is lower forever because regulation is better, uh, property rights are stronger, all that kind of stuff, mm -hmm. you wouldn't expect uh, you wouldn't expect that to change. So that that component of of uh, returns, you wouldn't necessarily expect it to expect it to repeat. And they also make the, the point that dividend growth. Uh, over the second half of the 20th century was again better than anybody would have expected at the beginning of the period and therefore we shouldn't count on the full amount repeating again. So I, I gave the XUS, global XUS return a, a, a few minutes ago. Um, the, the global return uh, on average was 5.2% from 1900 to 2020, so still much lower than the US. But the point Dimson, Marsh, and Stanton are making is that even that is probably too much to expect. And that's 5.2%. Inflation again was 3% over that period. So that's an 8.2% return. I don't think most people are expecting returns to be that high. It's still, still a good lesson. Uh, in the 2010 yearbook, they introduce analysis on emerging markets, which they can do with their historical data set uh, using GDP per capita to define an emerging market. And they kind of ran that analysis today and said, does that describe emerging markets? Yes, it does. Or the 30th percentile of GDP per capita captures most emerging markets today. So they use that to measure emerging markets in the past, uh, going back to 1900. One of the observations they make that I thought was pretty interesting is that over even over that 110 year at, at the time, uh, time span, not very many countries moved from emerging to developed, and likewise, not many moved from developed to emerging which is interesting because you would expect emerging markets to eventually become developed. And that's kind of what you're partially what you're betting on as a, mm -hmm. as an investor. 
Uh, but the reasons they give is that there were dictatorships, corruption, civil troubles, wars, unsuccessful economic and monetary policies, and communism. Those are the reasons for most of the emerging countries that stayed emerging throughout the full, the full period. Uh, and then the other points that they make about emerging markets are that, like, you kind of need them in portfolios because they make up a big chunk of the global capitalization. Uh, they they have been diversifiers, uh, but uh, bet, betting or assuming that they're going to have exceptionally higher returns because of their economic growth, and we've talked about this on on the podcast and in a YouTube video in the past probably doesn't make sense. Economic growth doesn't tend to correlate with stock market returns. In fact, a lot of literature documents a negative correlation. Uh, A stock market can grow for a lot of reasons that that don't result in returns to existing investors in that market. Uh, Now, because of risk, they do actually say that they expect higher returns for emerging markets because they are riskier, the prices are lower. Um, but not for the reason that people tend to tend to think. It's not the economic growth that you're betting on. Uh, they, they, in, in the 2015 yearbook, they extended that thinking to industries. So it's kind of like, okay, economic growth doesn't predict returns in emerging markets. What about industries? So they look at the dispersion of industries uh, over time, which is, which is pretty interesting analysis. One of the things that they kind of state going into this is that and, and uh, Ilmanin, in, in his 2011 book uh, on on expected returns, says the same thing that that industry portfolios uh, are not priced factors, or they're explained by they are fully explained by um, priced factors. So any any difference is just going to be kind of random. Um, so Dimson, Marshall, and Stein find that across. The, 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 the annual cross-sectional dispersion for all U.S. industries is 22%, but the average spread between the best and worst industries is 108%. That's in the U.S. data going back to 1900 through 2014. So the question they're asking, okay, there's this huge dispersion in industry returns. Can we pick industries? And they give the example that we've talked about before of, of railroads, which uh, ended up outperforming uh road tra- travel, like vehicle-related stocks and air travel stocks, uh, and the market. Railroads beat all that stuff, despite being a declining industry by market capitalization relative to the rest of the market. But then they also make the point that technology, a growth industry, has actually performed really well. So they kind of step back and say, it's not so much industry uh, shrinking or growing that is going to dictate differences in, in, in expected returns. Uh, it's prices. The kind of what you'd expect. It's it's the relative price, not the industry growth that is going to explain differences in returns. And they find mm-hmm. that. They find that doing a rotation strategy where you invest in the cheapest industries adds value to returns. Dimensional does this a little bit. They allow for some industry rotation by not capping industries at their cap weights. So the cheapest industry will be allowed to have, I think it's a 5 or 10% over allocation relative to the market um, without making a full industry industry bet. Uh, and then the other one that they did is they tested a momentum strategy. So it's like, okay, let's take the cheapest industries and sort by that. That leads to performance. But they also said, let's take the previous year's best performing industry and invest in that one every following year. And that also led to excess, excess returns. So they did observe both a value effect and a momentum effect within, uh, within industries. So I thought that was, that was pretty interesting. Mm-hmm. Uh, okay, I think I just have a couple more. So the, another big one they looked at was U.S. bonds. This one is really interesting. U.S. government bonds, and have, have they really been safe assets historically? Like bond prices are pretty high, yields are pretty low, bond returns have been insanely good for the last few uh, decades. What does the long-term data look like? Uh, so U.S. bond market has had two periods of major underperformance in the historical data. They reached a peak in 1915 and had a big decline until June 1920. They had lost 51% in real terms by June 1920. Wow. Uh, they did not recover their real value until 1927. Wow. Pretty ugly. And these are long-term government bonds that we're talking about. Uh, the 1940 bond bear market was even worse for investors. It started in December 1940. Uh, U.S. government bonds lost 67% of their value and didn't recover in real terms until 1991. Like, talk about an ouch. Pretty crazy. Mm-hmm. Uh, so it's kind of a 50-year bond bear market in in that case. 
uh, one of the points that they make is that in in real terms, in inflation adjusted terms, if if we see uh, high inflation, bonds can be just as risky or more risky than than stocks. Uh, sure. But I think one of the really interesting questions that they pose is we don't really care about bonds on their own. Everyone knows you think about bonds in a portfolio with with stocks. So how have bonds performed relative to stocks? Uh, or, or it's the timing, the correlation that matters. How, how have stocks done historically when bonds have done poorly? Uh, so we know they've been less volatile uh, and they've historically had imperfect correlation. Everyone thinks they're a good diversifying, a good diversifying asset. That's been true around the world. Recently though, and this, this point I found really interesting, especially given all the conversations in the, in the community and with, with Dave Pleka about negative correlations. And Dave, Dave mentioned this too when we when we asked them about it, but the recent correlations in between stocks and bonds have been negative. So people think like, cool, this is going to persist. We're going to have negative correlations forever. But when you look at the long-term data, there have been times where correlations have been like 0.4, 0.5 kind of thing uh, globally, po- positive. Uh, and in the very, in the full period, 1920 to uh, 1900 to 2020, it's been a slightly positive long-term uh, a- annual correlation. Um, so I thought, that, I thought that was pretty useful information. If you look back long enough, there's been a positive correlation between between stocks and bonds. Uh, in the 2012 yearbook, they look at uh, how stocks and bonds have performed under various inflation regimes. This is another one that I think is probably on a lot of, a lot of people's minds. Uh, high inflation uh, is also generally volatile. So not only is it high, it tends to be volatile at the same at the same time. And that results in a higher inflation risk premium for bondholders. Uh, and the other thing that's interesting about high inflation or, or scary about it is that it historically increases the correlation between stocks and bonds. Very high inflation is bad for both stockholders and bondholders, which affects the diversification benefit of bonds in, uh, in the portfolio. Uh, one of the things they do that's pretty interesting is they sort stock and bond returns by contemporaneous inflation. Uh, and that shows that in extreme periods of deflation, bonds are killers. Average a real 20% For sure. uh, annualized return in, in the most severe periods of deflation. Well, over the same period, stocks returned an average of 11%. And then as you go across their, their chart that they made, stocks increasingly beat bonds under less extreme deflation and moderate inflation. But then when inflation starts to get, get high again, um, stock returns... Uh, start to get a little lower, bond returns start to get negative. And then in the highest periods of inflation, both stock and bond, bond returns are negative, but um, bonds more so, a lot, a lot more so than than stocks. Um, all right, I'm going to stop. That's it. There's, That's there's it? so much, there, there's so much more. <laughs> there, there, there's a bit on mean reversion, um, but I'm going to skip it because we talked about most of the research that I, that, that they cover in this on, uh, we talked about it in a recent episode, so I don't think we need to. Okay. We don't need to rehash it. Okay, so let's go into the talking sense. I left my other cards at home, so this may be a duplicate. We'll see, but you and I have not seen these cards yet. Uh, I think we've had that one before. I think we've had that one before. Let's try this again. What is the first thing you ever purchased? I don't think we've had that one. I'll answer that. Oh. I remember the the first thing I, I saved up for. I remember going to the mall. I grew up in Lennoxville, Quebec. We used to go to the mall. There's a big new mall that this is back in the, gosh, 70s. We go to the mall. And that's when I was, I used to have a little worm farm. I was like six years old. I used to raise worms. So my parents taught me about how to, so probably the first purchase was I bought what's called buzz bedding. You ever bought buzz bedding before? So it's what you use when you want to raise worms. It's a special bedding for worms. So I went, remember going, I'm like, okay, I have to buy buzz bedding to build a, worm farm and I'm in the hole, like whatever it was, $20, let's say, and I don't make any money until I sell the worms, but that'll be weeks until they find enough worms to put in the farm. So that's the first thing I remember purchasing, but then I saved up that first summer selling worms to buy a stereo. I remember going to the store every Friday night, we'd go to the store and I'd idolize this Lloyd stereo. That's the first thing I ever bought. How about you? Uh, I, I bought a bike by doing chores. And I remember my mom had this whole chart that she made and I would do certain chores and that would earn me, you know, notional money or whatever. And eventually I got to buy a bike. So I, I remember that I, I used to buy gas for my boat 
I remember that when I was like 10 years old. I had a, we lived on a lake and I had a, an aluminum boat and we, we lived on the campus of a boarding school that my dad taught at. And I would give tours, was t- 10 or 11 years old, I would give tours to prospective families that were interested in sending their kids to the school. They would um, put the family in my hands, this, this kid, but I knew the campus really well. And I would walk them around, show them the different dorms and where the cafeteria was and all that yep. kind of stuff. And I would get $20 per per tour. And I would all, almost always take it and use it to fill fill my red plastic gas can with uh, with gas <laughs> so I could go riffing around the <laughs> lake for the rest of the day or the weekend or whatever. Uh, those are the some of the earliest ones I can remember. Here's another one. I must have been I'm kind of stumped. What is a creative way to save money? Creative. I mean, not the traditional dollar cost average, pay yourself first. In today's digital era, what's a creative way to save money? Does it mean uh, like to reduce your expenses or to put money into a savings account? What is a creative way to save money? I don't know if it's to re- reduce spending. I don't know. I, I find it easier as I get older. As I get older, there's less stuff I want. So like I'm completely out of the want kind of phase. So saving gets easier for me as I get older. Um, until you go to a really nice furniture store. There's a beautiful new furniture store in Ottawa that we went into a couple of weeks ago. You come home after that, it's like, wow, our furniture's garbage in the house. Oh, don't come to my house. You should see my furniture. I've got a... <laughs> Pretty <laughs> ratty Ikea couch. <laughs> well, well, you've got kids, right? It's not worth it. I'll tell but you how like, I save money. Okay, fire away. But, but our, our couch was, I, I find it uncomfortable. It was a pretty low couch, like Ikea couch. And I'm, I'm, I'm tall, right? So I'd, sitting on this low couch would hurt my, my back <laughs> and my hips. So I 3D printed new, new legs for the couch that raise it up to a level that's comfortable okay. for me. That was there cheaper you. than buying a new coach. That's a, that's there a creative way to save money. That, that, that saved money. So there you go. That's a, that's a better answer. Okay, we have a phenomenal bad advice of the week this week. Whew, this one's a Lulu. Anyways, um, as always, if you send us bad advice of the week, we're happy to send you a rash reminder hoodie, kind of like Ben and I are wearing today with the Christmas colors going on here. Anyway, so Mitchell is a longtime YouTube follower of yours. And he told us that he's worked his way through the entire library of RR episodes. And um, we've covered lists like this before, but this one's just too good to pass up on. So this is an article from Entrepreneur Magazine, the August 18th of the summer edition. And it was originally on the Market Beat site, whatever that is, on the same day. Anyways, the title of the article is Seven Downsides to Passive Investing and Why It Can Be Bad for Your Portfolio. Uh Uh-oh. Anyways, the article starts out nicely by saying, studies show that while many active funds outperform passive funds in the short term, they don't in the long run. Okay, so far so good. Only a small percentage of actively managed mutual funds actually perform better than passive index funds. Investors are attracted by ease of investments, low ease of investment, low cost, and less effort. So far so good. Passive investing typically takes a buy and hold approach. But uh uh-oh, head south pretty quickly. But does passive investing have its limitations? You bet. Let's take a look at a few reasons. They come up with seven reasons why passive investing can hurt your portfolio. So let's rip through these. Downside number one, they have preset limits. They lock you into a predetermined set of investments. I would argue that is a good thing uh, as it reduces emotion, keeps you in your seat, keeps you invested and low fees. Um, Active funds can, this is still part of downside number one. You you know what though? Sorry to interrupt. Fire away. I met with someone years ago um, that had sold a business and they, they found us and, and I, I had a conversation with them and it was a couple uh, and I thought we had a pretty good meeting, but they ended up going going elsewhere and yep. I, I inquired uh, what happened and, and one of the pair of, of the couple, um, had, had it was actually exactly this. They, they, they didn't like that it was set in a, in a, an allocation that was going to be locked in and, and it wasn't going to be able to change as the market changed. So I, I can see why someone would, I can't see why I, I have seen someone consider this a downside. <laughs> yes. Still under downside one. So that's the preset limit thing. Uh, active funds can deviate. They can take advantage of short term trading opportunities. I guess it means that they're smarter than the market. Passive investments don't follow a broad portfolio. I don't get that one. They are pretty broad. There's and no some, reason behind it? It was just a bullet no, point? 
I'm just giving you the bullet points. Okay. Sometimes it's not all good to track the S&P 500 instead of the wide gamut of available securities. So agree on that. You want more diversification than the S&P 500. Uh, downside number two, you have less control over your investments. You can't make changes if you see certain sectors or companies underperforming. Again, why is that bad? You fall when the market declines. This is the classic. It's still number two here. You fall when the market declines. So is there evidence that active managers don't? There's not. There's not. The most recent one was Lubosch Pastor, which we talked to him about. Yep. You cannot avoid companies you may dislike. That is true. If there's companies you don't want to profit from, you're right. It's hard to exclude those in an index portfolio. You can't react to the markets. Okay, true. But is that bad? You may not, in hindsight, want to react it to the markets. If you know, get this one, you're going to love this one. If you know a particular stock is overvalued or undervalued, your hands are tied. True, but do you really know? Uh, but it's a, you, you, you do tend to overweight naturally the larger, more expensive companies in the cap weighted index. So I, I, okay. I don't know if I wouldn't call it undervalued or okay, overvalued, but. So this goes back to the argument you talked about with Adam Grant. If you feel constricted by lack of control, passive investing isn't for you. Pick your own stocks. Is that really the best reason you should become a stock picker? Um, anyways, downside number three, holdings are overvalued. So this is what you alluded to with the S&P 500 or VTI. They all have similar type holdings. So yes, you should be more diversified. I'd, downside, I'd, say, they have, I'd say they have lower expected returns. I don't know if I'd say they're overvalued, but it's- I didn't, I'm just saying that's what- Oh, I know, yeah, I know, this. yeah. Uh, downside number four, they might not track the index exactly. Quote, if you expect an index fund to be a duplicate of a sector, think again. Fund managers make adjustments to individual funds, which causes differences between the fund and the index. I've never Seems heard like a of bit that of a, before. Seems like a bit of a straw man argument there, but anyway. Uh, we'll keep going here. Downside number five, you won't get above market returns. Just remember, average stays average. You can't outperform the market if you only keep pace with it. I, I love, in one of Larry's books, he talks <laughs> about the, the, the easiest way to be an above average investor. And it's by owning index funds because the average investor like dramatically underperforms the index. Exactly. <laughs> so that's number five. Number six, passive investments limit your investing knowledge and growth. So can passive investing turn you into a slack jawed automaton? Possibly. So does that mean we have to change the name of this podcast to like slack jawed automaton reminder or something? Um, when you stick your money in index funds, you rob yourself of the chance to research and learn more about investing in the market. So I guess the 166 episodes have been a robbery of our time. Any investing knowledge you could have gained goes by the wayside when you choose an index fund over picking individual stocks. You don't learn how to develop skills such as determining asset allocation. Really? Risk management. Really? Or valuing individual companies. Okay, give you that one. Investing can be a lifelong journey and an exciting process. Why limit your opportunities? Yeah, I find this one really interesting because I think it is a common perception that that if you learn how to invest in individual stocks and do comp individual security valuation, that you're going to become a better investor. But it comes back to my comment about Kahneman earlier that it's not a it's not a field that you can learn that way. But it doesn't mean that there's not a lot of learning that can be done. It's just not not that kind of learning. And there's so many people doing that that that's who you're up against. You're up against pros on every trade, and to assume that you're smarter than everybody else. In this adaptive system, not likely. Uh, number seven downside, sectors can limit your diversification. Some ETFs only track specific sectors. You may think your portfolio is diversified because you own ETFs from different fund companies. However, a lot of them own the same stocks. For example, growth focused funds may only expose you to large cap tech. I don't know Sorry. why this, how the sector, sector diversification ends up getting uh, included in the discussion about active versus passive. Anyways, you might need to pay attention to the sectors and concentrations in various funds. For example, if you have large cap holdings, you may need to balance those and that particular ETF with small cap stocks. Yeah, that's, that's true of whether you're using active funds or it's, it's not, it's not false, No, but, but it's not an argument against in, uh, index. No. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so the bottom line the author says is think carefully before you choose passive investing. Bogle warned 
investors in January 2019 that there may be too many shares in too few hands. He said that index funds could one day control the U.S. stock market, and he said that he didn't believe that such concentration would serve the the national interest. Yikes. The quote goes on. If the indexing pioneer says you should think carefully about your past investing approach, you should. So that's the first time I've read Bogle this overtly as an argument against indexing. Oh, yeah. No, that's a that's definitely a thing. That, that's something that people were quite worried about uh, a couple of years ago. Well, I get the argument, but I'm seeing a spin bogle back on index funds. Yeah, yeah, pretty crazy. Pretty crazy. And it's they're totally different arguments. Bo- bogle is rightly concerned about concentration yes. of control uh, of of companies in the big the big asset managers, but that's got nothing at all to do with whether or not an individual should choose to invest in index funds, unless they're trying to serve the public good by reducing concentration of control in those those managers. Exactly. Pretty good bad advice of the week. Again, if you have some ideas on that or you find one, send them our way and we'll send you a hoodie. Yeah, that was good bad advice. I agree. Good bad advice. All right. Last call. Anything to add? Uh, no, we always appreciate the reviews. Uh, keep them uh, keep them coming. And something I say in my YouTube videos but never really say in the podcast is that one of the best things that you can do to, to help us out is share share the podcast. Share with someone who who you think would find it useful. And, and with the comprehensive overview episodes, we'll have an increasing uh, amount of, I, I think, easier to share content. Someone listening to this episode for the first time, it's, I don't know how easy it is to kind of jump into it. And, um, and embrace it. And embrace it, yeah. Excellent. Okay, as always, thanks for listening. Thanks for listening.